brothers do you recall when the grasslands reach to the horizon? And the deafening roar of countless wings overhead. Back when Rome was a village and Britain the Emerald Island. Before we gave up on our future and buried our dead. All right, so it's episode four, and I finally recorded episode three um, over after a third attempt. Thank you, David, for being basically a saint and sitting through that. Um, it was fun doing the same material over and over. We had a little equipment failure last time, so I actually had to redo the previous episode that we did in this lovely discussion pretty much from scratch. So, but anyway, we're on to episode four and we are, you know, we moved past the Neanderthals finally, and we are to the Ice Age humans. Um, just, we just, <coughs> we now have just one set of humans left and that's Homo sapiens sapiens. And in this episode, I want to look at the culture and um, the, how should I put it? Uh, basically the overall lifestyle of the societies of the hunter gatherers in Europe, specifically in Europe uh, at the time of about 40 thousand years to about 15 thousand years ago. And I would like to do it through the prism of art and also through the prism of some of the lesser known, uh, you know, cultural archeological finds that are not necessarily from the Western Europe, you know, not the French and the Spanish sites that everybody knows about, not Chavez, uh, not uh, Altamir, but um, less less well, quite well known among their anthropologists and archaeologists, but a lot less known in the Western world sites that are located in Siberia and other such um, less well known places, I guess. So, a couple of things uh, that I just need to do as a beginning. I want to put a shout out to Marvine and the whole crew that is helping him out. They have moved away from Pony Radio. I'm still waiting to find out what their new platform is going to be. Once I do find out, I'm going to go ahead and put the links below this video. And also, I want to thank the um, scientists whose material I'm going to be he heavily relying on in this podcast, and, that, and that's Zhitinyov, who is an outstanding Russian scientist and archaeologist who is in charge of the Kapov cave right now. They are doing the restoration, excavation, and all the archaeological work there. And he's also doing all the uh, popularization uh, work as far as letting people know what's happening in that particular location. And also the archaeologists at the Kostenki site and everybody who is out there pretty much putting forth real science and not just um, wannabe science. All right, so a couple of um, interesting things as in, by the way, when Andrew, of course, first art um, is uh, officially recorded at this present time in science, it's 60,000 years ago. And the first art was jewelry, um, ornaments, as a way of a nonverbal communication between individuals and also between groups of individuals, kind of a, a way of signaling. Uh, of course, um, ostrich eggs that were used as cups and sometimes decorated was another one of very early finds. Uh, and uh, the last thing would be some reminiscence of certain organic materials. I know that very recently they found some woven carpets, kind of like uh, sleeping pads for, you know, cave floor or tent in Africa. And um, of course, ochre is, uh, we've talked about it the last time, it's a very important pigment that comes in a couple of colors and it's probably may have been the gateway to how humans started decorating themselves as far as the paint goes, because ochre is something that's used to ward off insects. It's also something that's used to uh, preserve and soften, um, you know, various pelts and leather products. And it's not a very far-fetched jump from, um, you know, painting your face in order to prevent parasites from getting into your hair and your eyes to actually using that paint to decorate your body in a more imaginative way and then moving on to painting on other surfaces. But that's, of course, just a speculation. And um, a very interesting find. I don't, I don't know how many of you have heard about it. It's actually fairly recent, but there was a site actually in South Africa where the scientists have taken samples of the paint that was applied to cave art. Um, and they tested the paint and they, at first they thought that they must have lost their mind. So they ran parallel testing. They went to several other laboratories and the test results kept, kept coming back the same. And what they found is that mixed into this paint was actual milk. It was milk from some sort of a bovine animal. And this was 50,000 years ago, at the time when humans not only have not even begun to think of agriculture and uh, having domesticated anything at all, 
uh, humans were completely and utterly lactose intolerant. So that's a very interesting find. Uh, find uh, I've heard scientists speculate that they think that they may have shot um, a feeding cow and then learned how to somehow remove the milk from her, which would not be that hard considering they had their own offspring. Uh, but the other option is, uh, you know, and this is again purely non-scientific speculation, but I don't see a reason why an individual case of taming could have not taken place or why you know, hunters would have not been able to put a cow in a situation where they could have cornered her and done what they needed to do and let, let her go. It seems fairly wasteful to me, at least in modern hunter-gatherer cultures, usually you do not kill a feeding um, cow just because when that baby cow grows up, it's gonna be more meat than it is now, but who knows how that went down, but it is an interesting and kind of intriguing find. And so, um, and these people that we're going to be talking about, these are people that ranged between France, Spain, Austria, Serbia, and Altai, Siberia. This is the range that these people occupied. And of course, this is an enormous territory. And what's interesting is across this entire territory, their culture, their art, their um, cult traditions, almost, I mean, there were certain variations, but a lot of the things between all of these different sites are pretty much identical. Not only are they identical over these enormous distances, they're also identical over very lengthy periods of time. We're talking about 30,000 years of the same kind of cultural tradition. If you give me a second, I want to pull up a map and show you guys because I went through great lengths to try to make this thing work. First culture, and it's not, I'm talking about the site of Kastenki 14, and that's located in Russia. But it's Kastenki is not just a site, it's also a culture. It's a very well-known culture. And it's the culture of the people who were hunting mammoth. And it was a very long enduring culture that lasted, that's the culture I'm talking about that lasted 30,000 years. Now, these are the people, um, um, well, first of all, Kastenki actually means bones. That's what the word means. So at this place was called bones from, I don't know, 14th century. Um, and it was discovered, officially put on record by Peter the Great in 1600s when he heard about these unusual and wondrous bones and he wanted to acquire them for one of his museums. And so he sent people to that site and to collect some of the mammoth bone, bones that were found there. Of course, the science and the excavation of this uh, site did not start until much later. Um, but uh, so this site begins where the Philogian fields erupted in Greece and that's 39,000 years ago. And, uh, that's the first occupation layer is right after you have the ash layer from that enormous eruption in Greece. Um, these were small uh, riverside settlements that they were pretty much settling on the um, riverbanks. Um, they mostly built very large houses, unlike the next uh, culture, the next uh, campsite that I'm going to talk about. But their houses were about 16 by 16 feet round. Um, they were half dug out into the ground. Usually they would put some sort of poles uh, over the top of the, of, of the, you know, the dugout. It's kind of a half buried house and probably cover them up with reindeer hides because mammoth hides would be simply too heavy to really be used for that purpose. And then on top of all of that, they would put mammoth bones, you know, mammoth ribs and tusks and other parts of mammoth bodies. Um, kind of as an outside almost wall outside of the skins. And so these were quite an unusual st structures, but th these could house quite a few people. I mean, they counted that ma at maximum 60 people could climb inside one of these and, you know, remain warm. Now, of course, these people were living at, at the very edge of the ice sheet. They were living during the ice age and they were mammoth hunters. As a matter of fact, they see, you know, their archaeology shows that they mostly ate mammoth and they fed their dogs reindeer to where in the rest of Europe, reindeer was considered to be perfectly good food. Um, some of these houses were uh, made up of uh, remains of as many as 90 individual mammoth. Um, they had this thing where they would cover their floor with just the lower jaws of a mammoth. And in one uh, house, they have 64 of those counted up. Now, archaeologists think that that's unlikely that they killed, you know, at any one given time, there would have been that many mammoth in that territory. I mean, mammoth is a very large, far wandering, far ranging animal that requires a lot of sustenance. And so it's highly unlikely that they would have killed all that, that many mammoth in, the, in a single setting. Most likely they found somewhere a depository of mammoth bones, what they call the mammoth cemeteries, and probably took the remains from there for their needs. Um, so um, at that time, uh, of course, the, this was um, a tundra type environment and uh, the, but that was populated by rather larger specimens of mammoth, the, the mammoths that lived in that region, you know, the adult males, they reached again about 16 feet tall 
at, at, the, at the neck, right? Five meters or 16 yeah, feet. Yeah, so and well, rabbits at the time were 28 inches tall. So, I mean, you even had some formidable rabbits. And of course, you know, they had the noble deer there, they had the reindeer, they had the giant elk, um, other prehistoric animals, and also just the common animals. And they also fished, they uh, used quite a bit of fish because they were sitting on the riverbanks and the fish were not much different than today. And also they were eating waterfowl, geese, uh, ducks, all that, those kinds of animals, but their primary staple diet, and actually their primary staple, everything was a mammoth. And archeologists think that uh, this culture, unlike for example, some of the later um, cultures in North America or in Europe where there was kind of an overwhelming slaughter of animals, to where they would just take what they needed and leave the, re the rest to rot in some cases. They think that this culture in very harsh of winter conditions, they probably were very, very sparing about how many animals they took. And on top of, of it all, mammoth is not exactly an easy beast to hunt. So that's a little bit about the Kastionki culture. It's the famous culture of the um, mammoth hunters and the people who lived in the mammoth houses, which I'm sure sl smelled absolutely lovely, considering they also used the bones for heating, for heating so they basically use it for fire. So, I mean, you can imagine the smell in those um, mm. lovely, lovely dwellings. The, well, not to mention dung and everything else. No, they didn't use dung, they actually just used bones. They primarily, they, archeologists are pretty pissed off because they cannot seem to find very many animal remains because they think that most of the animal remains just went straight into the heat. And this is also the same culture that is associated with the Paleolithic Venuses, which I'm sure you, everybody has heard about that are hotly debated about again, and we will get to them here in a minute. So the, the uh, uh, Zarayska, Zarayskaya site, um, it's an East, it's Eastern Gravet culture, and it's a Kastonki culture as well. And it was, um, you know, at, at its peak, it was about 23,000 years ago. And they have similar uh, sites in Czech, Re oh, what, Czech Republic. I, is that what it's called today? Yeah. I have a funny story about that. I'll maybe I'll tell if we have enough time, but, um, and, you know, in Austria and, uh, and again, this is a culture that, like I already said, they lived right along the edge of the ice sheet. Um, so six settlements have been discovered, all of them multi-layered, which means that they've been settled multiple times over and over and over again, over a period of time, and uh, over thousands of years, sometimes with several thousand year intermission between the settlement of the area. Um, so the way that the settlement was set up in the center of it, there would be a row of five to eight heath, you know, um, that were rather large and that were filled up with um, stones, with hot stones. So they were constantly kept burning because it was very cold. And the, these basically structures, they were completely filled up with the stones. And the, the stones were what was being used to um, heat the houses. So people would take those stones for cooking and drop them into, for example, into a skin with water in order to boil the water to make their food. Or they would bring them into the you know, actual residences to keep the residents warm overnight. Um, so um, these um, these heath, they were about uh, three feet round each, and they were probably about six feet apart from each other, but they were always um, oriented from northwest to southeast. In every settlement, there's always that orientation there straight in a row. And around these heath, in a half circle, were the houses. Now, the houses, um, about 10 of them per settlement, plus or minus. So they're guessing that, you know, likely there would have been no more than 40 people per settlement, uh, realistically, if you just count the space, because these houses were significantly smaller than the ones that we were talking about in the main, uh, in the Kastionki 14 culture. Um, so the way that these houses were shaped, they were like, basically like figure eight shaped houses um, that were only about two feet wide and about, 16 feet long. So the only way you could get in there is really just to crawl. I mean, they were tall, but they were about just this wide in the in, in the center of that figure eight of that infinity figure. So, it, and probably, I mean, tall enough to stand up and but really not tall enough to remain in during the day or do anything. So they think that people mostly just kept warm at night and slept in there. Around these houses, they found large pits with obsidian storages. So because where the where the site is located, there was not a good obsidian source anywhere nearby. And obsidian, of course, at that time was the most, um, important material to be used for the purpose of um, any making any tools really. So what people would do is th they would bring huge amounts of obsidian from far away and just stash it in enormous pits around the settlement so they could continuously use it uh, as they needed to replenish their tools and weapons. And around these houses, they also had other pits that were various sizes and shapes from very skinny to very large ones. Some of them went down with very, you know, several meters down. Some of them seem to have ritual purpose. Um, uh, 
but all of them would have a lid that would be carved out of a mammoth scapula and always would have a little hole in it, probably for grabbing the lid and lifting it. Uh, so, I mean, they were just used for storage, most likely. So again, the houses, they were either, you know, figure eight shaped or they were elongated, half dugouts, the same kind of basic construction as in the early settlement, but just much smaller, probably one family unit per house, you know, a couple of adults, a couple of children, that's about it. They actually found the children's milk, one of the a child's milk tooth at the bottom of one of these houses. So we have proof that there really were children there. Um, so they were used for sleeping only. Um, entrance was always facing the heath. And then the sleeping chamber would be in the section that's away from the heath. And so that they would, it would have a little step when you came into the house, it would have a little step down. And right in the front of the entrance, there would be a big uh, ochre circle on the floor. And they don't know what the purpose of this was, but it was an almost every dwelling uh, right in the, you know, that first entrance uh, area. And then this, some of the dwellings were also painted with ochre, you know, they were painted red. And actually when the people abandoned the settlement, a couple of times that they left the settlement, what they did when they put out the heath, they covered them very thickly with ochre as well. So again, we don't know what that means, but we can only pretty much guess what they might have had in mind. Um, so in the houses were heated with, uh, with the hot stones. Um, they were, the floors were covered with pelt, and we know that because they found, you know, when you skin an animal, especially a small animal like a mink, um, you oftentimes they will leave the toes and the feet intact, and that's those are the bones that were found on the floor of these residences. So they're pretty sure the floor was thickly lined with fur. Uh, was for items, but they also did had this weird thing where they would mix, mix auger with um, clay and heat it up. And as a result of that, it would kind of be half cured. And then they would break that up into almost like brick dust and cover the floors of their dwellings with this material. So it was semi-waterproof, I guess. Um, you know, and, and they it seemed like they have worked quite a bit, but they mostly worked in the little areas they had out right out front of their houses, right between the heath and the entrance to the house. Um, these houses also had mammoth um, parts, basically. And in this settlement, for example, they pretty much piled whatever mammoth bones that were large that they could find around their dwelling. And they also used that again, they used the uh, bones, primarily just bones for um, heating, uh, for the purpose of keeping the fire going. And um, Sometimes they used whole skulls at construction. And in some cases in front of the house, what you would have, you would have the entrance to the house and next to the entrance, you would have a mammoth skull actually dug into the ground facing outwards. And uh, when they were excavating one of these, they thought that they were just there as a part of the support structure, but it turns out that they were used for storing things. So deep inside the mammoth, you know, where the tusk is taken out, if you go into that cavity, there's a deep space inside the brain cage, basically. And that's where they found uh, up to 15 uh, obsidian, finely made obsidian tools in one case. And then in another case where they found a skull like that near house, it also had some uh, obsidian items um, hidden between the tusks of the mammoths because that one still had its tusks. Um, let's see, I, I think that's about it. Oh, awesome finds in this location, the Bison statue. So they found a bunch of the Venus statues and the Venus statues in these settlements are almost always found either buried beneath the entrance of the um, entrance way to the homes or they were buried beneath the heath. Some of them were buried at the bottoms of the pits. Um, one absolutely unique and amazing, and I wanted to show you guys a picture, but I don't know how to make it do that. Anyway, so they show, basically they found a really small statuette of a bison, but it's done so finely that, you know, the, the bison has eyes, it has, you can see its hooves, you can see its fur, you, you know, it's perfectly made, it's just, it's a work of art. And this bison, it had two of its legs broken off, it was stabbed with a sharp object on one side, um, doused with ochre on the other side. It had a really sharp bird bone, a sharpened bird, uh, bird bone shoved into its neck. And then in that condition, it was placed at the bottom of a pit on a little pedestal, covered with a pelt, covered with more ochre, and closed in and there. So they think that that was definitely some sort of a ritual significance, uh, um, basically some sort of a shaman shamanistic or hunting ritual or something like that. Um, and of course, there's evidence of them fighting, uh, hunting mammoth. They found several mammoth, you know, sets of mammoth remains with obvious uh, damage from spears on them. Um, the settlements themselves seem to be located near mammoth cemeteries. So it seems like people were purposefully seeking out these, I guess, places where they could find the bones for their construction. And, um, you know, and there were no burial sites found anywhere near 
any of these construction zones and they don't know why they just have not found any burials no actual human remains besides that you know a tooth here a finger there but um from what they were able to analyze from the material they did find these were the same people genetically as the people in western and eastern europe so um so that's everything about the kostenki culture for now and i'm going to let people jump in if they have something they want to say hey i've never actually heard it uh, called that uh auker however it's pronounced but yeah i've heard a lot about it and it usually is a reddish tone from what i remember or yellow uh, or yeah it can be yellow too but um yeah it's it's not the same as hematite it's different than iron tetraoxide or whatever it is it's rust but it's it's pretty much iron from what I remember. And yeah, yeah, it's apparently been used for a very long time, but I don't I don't really know that much about its use aside from uh, actually here in the Americas. So that's kind of new to me that, so they really used it a lot as decoration. They, they still do in Africa. In Africa, for example, they still do it uh, routinely um, as a way to fight off insects really, especially during the season when the biting insects are particularly kind of vicious. What they will do is they will cover, and in Siberia, the same thing, they will cover whatever exposed body parts there are, their hair even covered with it, because insects, they just don't like it, they don't go there, they will cover their floors with it, so again, you know, various, you know, bed bugs and such don't get into the lining of their, you know, sleeping places. Well, that, that was very much news to me. <laughs> I'll have to get some of that next time I go in the woods, especially <laughs> if I can't find a duty barrier around to rub it on my skin. Dry sheets. I'm telling you, dry sheets are the way to go and eat a lot of garlic. Okay. <laughs> All right. So if any, unless anybody else wants to say anything else. Okay. I'm going to go to Songiri. Has anybody here even heard of that particular location? I think it's probably one of the most amazing finds. So in Songiri, a very unique um, burial was found. And this is a case where they actually found a burial that is contemporary and most likely very similar to the Alakastenki uh, culture. So what was found here originally, when they, there was actually some, there was a, some sort of commercial uh, digging going on, um, crater excavation for sand or whatever reason, Soviet Union, 1960s, and they came across some mammoth bones, and of course they called in the archaeologists. And when the archaeologists came there, first what they saw, you know, right on the surface layer, or what used to be the surface layer at the time when this burial was actually made, right on top, there was a large stone, very large rock, and next to it was an, a human skull that was intentionally left there as a part of the thing. Well, they started digging down below and below the skull first, they found the burial of a grown adult male. And this man, um, he, you know, he was in, this is pretty cold area. He was in fairly good condition. The burial was intact. This man was absolutely enormous. I mean, he was um, um, very wide in the shoulders. It's something that's almost never seen in the Cro-Magnon population. Um, he was very burly. I mean, this guy could probably outdo any wrestler, any boxer, any sort of heavy weight lifter that we have today. I mean, he literally, he had um, Homo sapiens sapiens um, body type, but he had Neanderthal build. He had huge arms, huge muscles. And he was buried in the, what was remaining of his clothing. There was a little leather cap that he was wearing. And uh, all around his body, there were thousands, literally thousands of little beads made out of uh, mammoth tusks. So that, and uh, also he is, as you know, as they did a reconstruction of him, and that's another thing I wanted to show you, but this man was definitely equatorial or uh, astroloid in the appearance, um, something, you know, and originally they reconstructed him as being very dark skinned. Right now there's some debate, um, you know, where he got those features, but, you know, as we will see from the other two burials at the same site, the population at that time, because all there's three, basically three sets of remains found at the site. They were all buried, well, four sets, which were all buried simultaneously at the same time. It was a single, you know, burial complex. But all three individuals buried there were completely different, what we would call today racial type. But back then there was no such thing as racial type. There were just little groups, which each one of which was very divergent from the next one because people were in little isolated enclaves and everywhere you had, you know, the founder effect where just one person in a small community happens to have a big nose and suddenly all the offspring wind up having big noses or, you know, somebody winds up having blue eyes and then you have a whole, you know, group of people with blue eyes. So there was a lot of variation. There was no such thing as modern races back then. What you had is a lot of little groups that all, looked, and plus with the whole hybridization that just happened with the, you know, the Denisovians and with the Neanderthals and we don't know what was what other hominid species. There was so much variety that no two groups of people looked the same. And even these three individuals, though they were buried together in the same grave, 
you know, they look like they belong to, to three different modern races. So that's just, a, in, and the, these guys are in Siberia. So that's just something interesting to think about as far as how recent the whole idea of race is, you know, the, the actual formation of what people call race today. So, the, so they thought that this was an awesome find and then they started digging further. And what they found was two boys. Two boys were buried, they were buried head to head on their backs with their feet facing out. One boy was 13, one was nine years old. This is important. Um, both boys, uh, you know, seemed to be in fairly good health. Uh, there was some sign of trauma, like blunt force trauma. There's some debate that maybe the younger boy may have been a sacrifice, or may, they, they think that one of the boys may have been a sacrifice, but they're not entirely sure whether or not that's actually the case. Both boys were buried extremely richly. Um, so they thought that they found a lot of beads on the adult male because they found literally thousand plus beads on him. Well, on these kids, they had so many beads and uh, you know t teeth of various animals like mink and uh, foxes stitched onto their what used to be their leather clothing that when they opened up the grave, the clothing of course has rotted away a long time ago, but they were able to use the pattern of the beads to reconstruct what these people were wearing. And what they were wearing was not anything like you would imagine people in the ice age wearing. These were very sophisticated, complex leather and fur clothing, you know, where, where they more or less were spacesuits, you know, very similar to what, nor, you know, far north living people were today. I mean, they had hoods, they had hats, they had fur trim, mm -hmm. they had, you know, they had, uh, they had pants and that was stitched to their boots, that was stitched to their, most likely was stitched to the, you know, to the jackets or whatever you want to call it, the parkas that they had on top, multi-layered clothing, but every set of clothing was completely covered. I mean, we're talking about, you know, several thousand, you know, up to 10,000 uh, of these mammoth beads per individual. Their little hats, everything. They were buried with uh, grave goods, all of them were. And, uh, you know, they started, of course, doing analysis on these people. They were curious to find out what these people did. So the grown man, the, the adult male, who was super burly, it turned out that he was doing some sort of a knocking motion, like the kind of damage that there was on his left on his bones, that he was constantly making this kind of a motion. So or he was knocking something or grinding something or breaking with great force, most likely stones or rocks or, you know, obsidian or something like that. On the older boy, they found the signs that he spent most of his life on his knees, kind of making this kind of motion, you know, when you're going around like that. And they think that, that you know, and that child may have been involved in the actual making of those beads. The younger boy uh, from his bone um, structure, they could tell that he spent most of his life squatting and making a motion like this, like almost like spearing something. So they were very curious to find out what it was uh, that they, that he did, you know, because I mean, was he fishing? I mean, you don't usually fish while you're squatting down. So then they decided to do some analysis of the, you know, what remains of these people and to see what their diet was like. And it turned out that even though these people lived together, you know, exactly the same time died together, the adult male and the um, older boy, they had primarily meat and with some plant material diet. So, and they regularly eat a lot of good, healthy red meat. The nine-year-old, on the other hand, um, had a very unique diet. His diet completely consisted of invertebrates. And specifically out of um, caterpillars and, uh, you know, insects that have not matured yet. And that's pretty much, in, based on the analysis, he maybe had two pieces of meat in his entire existence ever. He had, he had no fish, no plant food, his entire, absolutely entire diet, most likely, I mean, not most likely consisted of the invertebrates of, you know, basically worms, caterpillars, things like that. Now, here's the interesting question. I mean, if you live in a situation where you're living right next to the ice sheet, your summer is going to be super short. It's going to be like, what, maybe a month if you're very lucky, when you're going to get any insects and larvae, larvae around. The rest of the year, you're not going to get any invertebrates there because it's too darn cold which means that somehow these people gathered enough and this child showed no sign, signs of mal malnutrition. I mean, he had plenty of this food. So I, obviously they were able to gather up enough of these invertebrates and somehow store them for the remainder of the year in order to be able to sustain him. But it gets more interesting than that. Next to the nine-year-old, there was buried a, a bone, a hollowed out bone, a human bone that obviously belonged to an individual who was kind of really kind of crooked and not malformed. Um, and it was used as a container for some ochre, is how you say it in Russian. So I'm just going to say it, and everybody hopefully knows when I say ochre, that's what I mean, it's that red pigment. Um, so th just out of curiosity, they decided to DNA test the boy and that bone that was left next to him in his uh, burial site. And the bone turned out to be his genetic ancestor. 
uh, his great great grandfather who also whose diet also exclusively consisted of the invertebrates. And so if those two remains would have been found, you know, even in neighboring graves, you know, anthropologists would have said, okay, maybe there was a time, period in time when this culture went through a time of hunger and they were forced to eat insects, right? But these boys were buried together at the same time. So they're thinking that it was most, uh, most likely some sort of a dietary taboo or limitation that most likely had to do with the social class. Because obviously, even though the other two, you know, obviously performed a lot of hard physical labor, the man and the older boy, they were eating a lot of red meat to where these two other individuals were not only buried, to, well, the boy was buried with remains of his great grandfather. They both were limited to eating only kind of one kind of food. And that's behavior that's often associated with shamanistic class, you know, with shamanistic um, tradition in the modern um, ethnographical studies. So. Um, it's it's just it's very interesting to think about how these people lived, how they perceived the you know reality around them, how this boy had was able to survive his entire life and not be malnourished in any way only on insects. And finally, they did genetics analysis on well, the remains that they found. I don't know the actual method for it, but somehow they can follow a person's genetics and figure out roughly what the pool of the people is that contrib contributed to these individuals, um, basically genetical diversity. And they came up that the gene pool that these people were drawing on was exactly between 250 and 340 individuals. Now that's a number that's too big for any little tribe in that time in that area. So they're thinking that it was most likely a situation where smaller tribes broke up during hard times like the Inuits do and then gathered at times when it was more plentiful into larger groups in order to intermarry, to solve some sort of mutual problems, do large hunts together, just social lines. Um, so that's pretty much everything about Sungir. Sungir is still being studied, it's still being excavated. It's a very, a lot of information is still coming from it. Um, you know, by, to a modern eye, well, you know, you can see that one of the boys looks kind of more mongoloid, but the other one looks more kind of typical European. And then, the, you know, the, the, old, the older male, he looks uh, more equatorial, but uh, they all were members of the same community. They lived next to each other and they obviously died together. Um, I'm going to stop and see if anybody wants to jump in with anything. Mm -hmm. um, I actually just had kind of a quick question. It's about the, um, <clears throat> you think that, uh, uh, I don't know, postulate, uh, hypothesize, whatever, that um, the very strict diet of eating only, um, you know, invertebrates, uh, the insects, worms, whatever, that might have had something to do with um, maybe some sort of a religious practice, uh, something that's, that had that's, to do with yeah. Yeah, that's what they think. They think it was most likely it was a shaman or some sort of a, you know, some sort of a cult practitioner. And that's why they were limited because it's, it obviously wasn't something that was because he was poor because the effort that would have gone forward forth into the gathering of that many insects in that kind of climate, I mean, just would have, I mean, the whole tribe would have had to assist on some, or at least one right. member of the tribe would have had to stay completely out of any other social activities and hunting activities and just spend his entire time doing nothing but that. And he was a child too. So, um, okay. That just seems like an interesting theory, so to speak, or maybe it's hypothesis, whatever, but um, because I have heard of things like that in terms of, like, for example, um, some healers, it is believed, they have to eat very strict diets, and it's not because, like, say, uh, red meat will make them sick, no, far from it, but it's believed that as a healer, that role, that they would have to eat a very strict diet, so I found that kind of interesting. Yeah. Healers eat, eat a lot of protein and a lot of vegetables. I know I've done healing before and I've taken courses in it. So but when you've do, done the healing, you get really tired and it's meat and vegetables that, that bring it back. See, see that, there we go. Um, I know that in some practices, it's actually a lot of actually car carbohydrates that you need, you know, especially if you exert yourself in certain magical ways. Um, um, I, per I know I personally, in those situations, I need sugar, um, sugar bait. I mean, not straight sugar, well, okay, sometimes straight sugar, but Basically, like, it, I think it just depends on the culture, person's metabolic rate, and what exactly it is that they're practicing. And the situation. Sometimes I know that in some cases you can eat nothing but meat and raw meat, actually. So, so we're going to do a little intermission just in about general art of that time period. You know, of course, the Neolithic uh, Venuses, which were originally found and horrified the nice Victorian gentlemen because they have very voluptuous forms, so to put it delicately. I mean, they're downright pornographic. Um, they are also very different from, you know, today's uh, standard of beauty to where today's standard of beauty does preclude more um, youthful female forms. Um, I believe that at that time when women were giving birth a lot more, 
uh, frequently and uh, under much more straining conditions. I think that the standard of beauty, because some of these statues, I mean, you have the station where the breasts are literally hanging down to the belly. Um, you have very kind of large sagging forms, but that was the standard of beauty, standard of fertility, and standard of the, you know female ideal. Not necessarily, in my opinion, not in a pornographic manner, but in a functional, reproductive, social manner, which is what would have mattered the most to a society that is trying to survive. Uh, these were again were there. There is a method to the way these uh, figurines are buried. Almost none of them have a face. Only one, actually, in Kastenki, 14 was found with actual face on her. Most of them don't have a face at all. They have very little feet. Um, you know, they have very large breasts, very large buttocks, um, very large female parts. Um, a lot of them have a thing where you can hang them up. So there have been some um, suggestions, some guesses as to what these things might represent. One of, for example, has been that it is a spare body. So a person can wear, wear this in, as an amulet and so that their soul can go inside of this amulet in case something happens. Another suggestion is that it is a representation of either the foremother, you know, of the particular clan, or it's the representation of kind of the clan soul. And I'm, how many of you are familiar with the concept of what kind of a, you know, tribe soul or clan soul is? It's, it's the collective soul that you share as a people. So it's, you have your own personal soul, but then there's a soul that is all of you, your entire lineage soul. And that it, this, this is why it would be a faceless figure, because it represents not an individual, but the whole, the whole group from beginning to the end. And then there's another really cute and funny theory, which I'm just going to tell you just because it's funny. So um, and this comes straight from Marwine. I stole it from Marwine. But um, I guess there was a female archaeologist one time who was rather voluptuous lady herself, who was looking at these, you know, Neolithic, um, uh, sorry, Paleolithic um, Venus figures. And she was looking at herself and she was looking at the figure and then she was looking at herself. And what did she see? <laughs> Little legs, no head, right? So she put forth a theory that it might have been female artists who were trying to self-represent. I, I don't know how realistic that guess is, but I think it's a cute idea anyway. So there was a lot of small art objects. There was not, you know, we're about to jump onto the cave art, but there were a lot of small art, um, art objects found. Uh, they were uniform. They remained like the method of making these objects and the types of objects that were made, they remained uniform through space and time pretty much. Um, continuously for thousands, and I mean thousands of years. I'm going to send you guys another file real quick. Because darn it, I prepared these files for a reason. Mm -hmm. I did not do this just so that I could not show you guys. I couldn't open the file that I got for some reason. You I'm not sure. Which one? Uh, the, the first one. It, it actually sent twice. I'm kind of confused, but... Okay. Did I send it twice? You're not able to open it? Is anybody have, else having problems? I got, I got them. I got them both, and they're, did, did they're anybody fine. get the PDF? Did anybody get the side maps PDF? Well, I just sent it, so hopefully we we'll get that. Because, so yeah, that's kind of that just that's just a map that, to show you. Like, I mean, I plotted to see, you know, to show where. And here's one of the um, actual, uh, you know, reconstruction for the for the um, mammoth bone structure houses. How they think that the larger ones. How they think they may have looked. So. Um, I think that was just my technical difficulty on this end. It just won't open. So I think it. I think on your end, it, everything is good. Okay. Machine is problematic. User error. I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll talk later, Ryan. We'll figure something out to, to fix with your computer. <laughs> but anyway, so, so uh, some of the things that were kind of common to this tradition was that the statuettes were, um, uh, you know, they were, um, situation where you have the part that symbolizes the whole and that goes on throughout human tradition forth from that point on to where, for example, later on in Egypt or even in Greece, when a person wants to make a sacrifice to, let's say, a healing god, you know, and their leg hurts, they will just do a little, you know, figurine of just their leg and not their whole body. So that's that's a concept of where you have, in Scythian art, you have a thing where a clock can represent the whole animal and that just is, it, it's a tradition that goes on and on to where you have, it's a very symbolic tradition. Eventually what it does, it leads to actually to writing. Because when you have just, you know, one part of an animal or one part of an object representative of the entire thing, that's where you start getting your kind of letter symbolism, almost like those disattached symbols that later will evolve into our alphabet. Um, they, they have found some statuettes that were made out of composite parts. So in other words, you had a statue that has arms, legs, and then there was some, some sort of material obviously connecting it was a posable statuette. So they had things like that, even sophisticated. They find some children's toys that are 
you know, made out of stone or made out of bone, which are like usually of mammoth or rhinos or just, you know, some little animals that they think were maybe hung over the cribs or, you know, given to children to play with. Um, and what they find over and over at all the different sites, they find, you know, they have a site where they find a bunch of broken statues of one kind or, or another, right? But in they find a kiln or an oven right next to where the statues were broken. And they actually had a physicist and chemist do analysis on the statues themselves. And what they determined is that these little figurines that were made right there on site. So people came to the sacred place, they made these little figurines, waited for them to barely cool down enough to where you could take them into your hands and then shatter them immediately and never touch them again. I mean, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a practice that just you see repeatedly everywhere. Um, out of the most famous and unique finds, of course, there's that bison that I've mentioned above. There's the one case of the, you know, Paleolithic uh, uh, Venus figure where she actually has a face. Uh, there's the famous oldest the German lion man. I'm sure everybody heard about it. And it's the uh, anthropomorphic, zoo anthropomorphic creature that is half man, half lion. Uh, that was also found broken into pieces. And then in uh, Kastenki, they found a human, fa uh, basically kind of a, almost a clay figurine of human face, which is a unique and rare find. And then as far as music instruments, this is where we start finding definite human instruments. Flutes were made, they were made out of, uh, you know, hollow uh, bird bones. They were made out of composite tusk, uh, pla basically where people would put together pieces of a tusk to make um, a flute. They also were finding various spinners, shakers, you know, various instruments for, you know, concussion type instruments, drum, drums type instruments. Um, and a, a character that we're going to talk about here a little bit later, and that's anthrozo anthrozoomorph figure that is very prominent in the cave art. Um, oftentimes you see this thing sticking out of its mouth. Um, if you look at a lot of the cave art in France, in Spain, in Russia, you have this creature that's half human, half animal and he will have something sticking out of his mouth and they think that may be a flute. Um, there's some reason to believe that that actually may be a representation of music, that this character, that is most likely a representation of either a deity or a most, most likely a shaman, or at least somebody performing, you know, the cult functions um, is actually using music, which would make a lot of sense because rhythm and music is very much used even today in all kinds of religious practices. Anybody wants to jump in with anything? Yeah, there we got it. It's kind of amazing how um, much that stuff continued. Um, I'm thinking even the Neolithic and into the, the Iron Age, actually, um, in England, um, they, people would make offerings in, in, of tools and, and weapons, but they would break them before they, they toss them into the water. And also we have on the West Coast here, a thing called Cocopelli, who would travel amongst the tribes giving stories and Spreading his seed wherever he went, but he was, is always pictured with a flute in, in his in his mouth. That's just it's, it's a West Coast legend. I just think that it's pretty obvious that music is obviously very inherent into um well like our religious or spiritual practices, whatever. Of course, so yeah, Cocapelli, uh, very popular here in the Americas. Um, there's just countless stories about uh, shamans that use drums and other instruments. Um, I was kind of blown away by how varied some of the instruments are in, um, I don't even like the Grateful Dead, but Mickey Hart did a really nice book called Planet Drum, and he has just countless artifacts that he, he did a really good job with that book. But yeah, it's just hard to deny that music and uh, human spiritual practices have obviously been pretty tight overall. It's, that's that's yeah. something I'd like to go over with more like maybe in the next podcast or something, but yeah. we can do that forever. Yeah, absolutely. No, and and you know, and there's some. There've been some, you know, psychology, psychiatry, psychiatric and psychological studies on the, the effects of music on human psyche and especially of rhythm. Um, and they think that there's the, it has a actual physiological uh, resonance and re, you know physical response that it causes in human body. So now I'm going to go to the cup of cave, and I just send you right before I send you the last image of the Tsungirim of the large man reconstruction. I send you just the entrance to the cup of cave. They are working right now with Jodinov uh, in his last, uh, you know, presentation said that they are actually in the process of creating a 3D tour of the of the cave because it is a very unique cave on the one hand, but on the other hand, it is so representative of every other European uh, cave with actual like animal cave art that it is just a, because it's so it's not as well known as the other ones. I chose it and because I know it better and I know the people who work there. Um, but um, but also it's just representative of the entire that entire you know huge stretch from Spain to basically Siberia. 
So Cup of Kiev, it is 40,000, uh, it was occupied, it's in South Europe. Uh, it was occupied about 40,000 to 15,000 years ago. And it was discovered in actually 1959. And it's just the cool story behind the discovery. Uh, it, the World War II just ended and there was a young World War II veteran who was studying to be a biologist at the Moscow State University or some other larger university. And his name was Ruman. And I think that he is worth remembering. But he was wondering how come in all over Europe there's cave art and there's none in Russia. He did not think that was very cool. So he took a map and he started doing methodical actual probability studies of various locations on Russian territory to try to determine where there may be actual cave art. And eventually he was able to locate um, a place that, you know, it was a natural uh, nature preserve uh, far off in Siberia that he thought would be a good prospective place to go searching for cave art on the territory of Russia. And so he was offered a really good job when he graduated, but he refused the job and he said, no, send me to be a gamekeeper at this nature preserve because he believed that he's going to find this cave art. Well, they sent him there and long behold, very shortly, he found the cave art. I mean, um, it was kind of one of those things, but I mean, he did, wasn't pure luck. He did do a lot of research and of course there was some luck. Actually, the archaeologist who first came to look at the cave when he wrote the paper, you know, and let everybody know, they thought that he was imagining things until they made it to the, to the top floor. And then they saw that he was actually right. There was some beautiful cave art there. So, um, so there's calcite, you know, we talked in one of the previous podcasts, calcite is that, you know, when minerals drip over the surface of a cave and uh, cover up the painting, it's kind of a milky crust. So they're still removing the calcite level uh, layers from the cave and finding new and new paintings every year. It's been worked at, you know, nonstop since it has been discovered. Uh, the, there's various um, drawings in that cave. I mean, of course, there's lines, spots, weird, you know, kind of zigzags, there are handprints. They have a bison there. They have a rhino. They have, of course, a horse, fish. Um, and then they have a two hump camel. This two hump camel has caused quite an uproar when it was originally discovered. Now we're talking about, this is Ural Mountains, okay? The nearest location where at that time there would have been a two hump camel would have been near the Caspian Sea. That's 5,000 kilometers distance. Um, I think I even trans translated the kilometer. No, that's the one place I didn't actually translate. 5,000 kilometers is what? 3,300 something miles. I mean, it's, it's, it's quite a, a trek. And of course, nobody at first believed that they called it camel-like animal until they started find, also finding these um, shells at, this, at the site of the Kapov cave. And these shells, they're actually, they were already uh, fossilized by the time these you know, ancient people lived there. But they've, these shells were only found in, also in the area of the Caspian Sea. And these people thought that they were very beautiful. So they took these fossilized uh, shells, they made decoration with them decorations with them and they also brought them with them. So it's obvious that the population actually traveled back and forth between the shores of the Caspian Sea and actually the Ural Mountains and it did it continuously. I mean, probably not every year, but they did it. It was an ongoing thing. Um, so, um, you know, the artists at that time, they used the cave surfaces and a lot of these, the reason why the cave art is so hard to view in an album or on the screen is because they used the three dimensional features inside the cave to, you know, emphasize certain aspects of the cave art, you know, to, to add three dimensional shape to their images. Um, they oftentimes use the calcite for, and actually to this day, some tribes still do it. They go into the cave and they use the calcite for medicinal purposes and also for religious purposes. So they'll scrape it off and break it up. And sometimes they also add it to the um, paint that they're using. Um, they did not live in these caves, but they regularly traveled there. I mean, it seemed to be like, almost like, you know, people go on um, to the Holy Land. I just lost the word, okay. pilgrimage. So it seemed like it was almost like a site of pilgrimage. So, and people would come there and they can tell from the links it's because this is a very cold kind of, and it's a wet cave, the bottom layer, but it has always been flooded. So that's just the top two layers and the, the little hidden spot in the very top. But um, it's it's wet, it's, you, it's not comfortable even in the summer being there for any lengths of time. So people would obviously come there, they would come and you know run a fire maybe for a couple of hours, do whatever it is they came to do, clean up after themselves thoroughly. They came with their families and they, um, and they would bring snacks with them. And, uh, you know, archaeologists, they find the residue of these snacks. And, they, you know, normally people, when they would travel, they would kill a horse or mammoth, you know, some large animal and eat it, right? Well, to the cave, they would bring basically an equivalent of a sandwich. They would bring like a groundhog, for example, or, you know, a rabbit that probably was likely already pre-cooked that they would just, you know, have a quick snack while they're doing their rituals, 
clean up as much as they could after themselves and leave. Um, the people in that in those caves, and actually in all of these caves, people were very thorough at keeping them clean, unlike today's, you know, hikers. Um, they also um, brought with them wood because some of these drawings and a lot of these caves are way above a place where a normal person can get to. So they would have had to construct some sort of, um, you know, way of getting up there, either ladders or, so, or even sometimes like long-term support structures. And in, in this cave in particular, they find they found not only residue from the small branches and the small, you know, pieces of wood brought to, you know, kindle the fire, <clears throat> but they also find um, where, you know, large beams were actually placed into the floor, and, you know, as basically support beams for some sort of structures that were also dismantled and removed once the work was done. Um, they worked on leather and wood um, in, in, while they were in the cave. I mean, again, this is not a site where they lived. It's not a site where they would be making their everyday supplies. But in ethnography today, we see that a lot of ritual practices, like if you're making your wedding dress in certain tribes, or if you're making a funeral outfit, or if you, you know, you're going to make a promise to the spirits, you know, you make that particular costume right then and there in front of the, you know, of the spirits in the holy place. So there's some, some signs that people did some ritual work, you know, work like leather, stone, stuff like that. Um, they also found their remains of small wooden carved cups that were left in the, in the, in the ground that were used for whatever reasons, whether for liquid, that we don't know. Um, they also found unique find of Paleolithic ceramics with actual patterns on them. So people knew how to make ceramics back then, even before the Neolithic times. There were small cups also, and they had, you know, they were probably used for, you know, carrying paints or some other things. They were very not large yet, but the fragments of those with patterns already put on them. And they, these were, you know, uh, burn in the kiln and everything else. Um, and also they used calcite uh, lamps. So they took pieces of calcite, they kind of hollowed them out and they were using oil lamps while they were inside these dark caves. And that's how they saw they would use not oil lamps, fat lamps. So they would use like mammoth fat or other animal fat to, you know, with some sort of a whisk to warm, to, to heat, basically light up their environment. Um, they, um, let's see, um, they, in a lot of, of these caves, they hid um, caches of uh, uh, her and of uh, like, sometimes they would draw, they would bring almost like a, pieces of paper, I mean, would, would, they would be stone, like flat plates of stone that they would draw something on and then erase it, then break the plate, bury it in the corner of the cave intentionally and ritually bury it, and then bury the paint and all the supplies with it. And you find this all across these, you know, caves all across Europe. That seems to be a repeated ritual. Um, and this continued for thousands of years, sometimes stopping, sometimes starting up again. And it is... Um, very interesting because there was a kid in Spain some years ago who tried to fake cave art. So he was a talented painter. So he went into a cave and he actually painted all these figures. And when the archaeologist, and then he said he found it. So when, you know, people found it, the, the, the king of Spain was excited. Everybody was excited. And archaeologists went, we don't think so. Well, it's because what he didn't know is that all these caves, they're not, those paintings, those drawings, they're not random. There's actually a plan to them they can predict where to find what in each cave because they know what the layout is. This layout is another thing that has remained constant throughout thousands of years. So what usually happens is on the entrance level of this cave, you have uh, grazing animals, mostly you have horses, occasionally other grazing animals, but it's mostly horses that are at the main, uh, you know, other prey animals that are on the main floor. Then, uh, you know, deeper into the cave or higher up into the cave where it gets darker and more secluded, you have your prey, I mean, your predators, predators and other um, impressive animals, so, you know, mammoths uh, or, you know, cave bear, uh, occasionally, you know, various members of the cat family. And then in the very furthest, hard, hard to reach area of that cave, usually it's either up on top in some little hidden nook where you can't really find right away in the dark. They have this character that they call the anthrozoomorph, which they don't know what it represents, but it's that half human, half animal composite character that is usually dancing or doing some sort of, um, you can see that it's an action. It can have a bird's head, like in this particular cave, in the uh, cup of cave, he has mammoth tusks, for example, coming out of uh, his body. And usually that's the character that holds the flute. So these were definitely, they were places so of worship with specific plan uh, laid, lay, layout and plan to it. And people came there, they came there bringing their children. Um, it's interesting, uh, you know, the story that Chetignoff was telling in one of his lectures is that um, the, the, in some of the French caves, there are footprints left on the floor. And the, for the longest time, you know, anthropologists wanted to know, well, what the heck were these people doing here? They thought that all the footprints, they were teenage footprints because a lot of them have crumbled. So somebody got the idea to, because nobody in Europe can track bare human feet anymore. 
they actually flew in a group of uh, Bushmen into France to look at these and try to read these footprints for them. And when they brought them to the cave, you know, there was a bunch of laughter because they, they were saying, what, you can't read this? What's wrong with you? This is, this is stupid. This is it's blatant. And they read exactly. So the footprints were from people of all ages, all sexes. There are some places in the caves uh, where people would only walk on their heels. And uh, what the, these trackers told them is that people do that when they try to hide their identity. And they, they will walk on their heels and they will back out of uh, an area so that in this case, I mean, usually they would do it if you, they don't want the neighbor to know that, you know, you stole or whatever. But I mean, in this case, because it is a sacred place and it was usually around the play, you know, part of the cave where you had the most sacred drawings, it was most likely the spirits that they were concerned about. Um, they also found one of the buried in one of the French caves, they found a very touching uh, re remain. So, in the, you know, imagine it's a cave, it's dark, you know, there's basically imagine there's like a church service going on, right? And you brought a little kid with you. And in this case, it was a three-year-old girl, and that's what the trackers told the anthropologists. So somebody brought this little toddler with them, and it's dark, and she's bored. And so there's a ledge right there in the cave, and they set this girl down on the, on the ledge, kind of like in a child, you know, car seat. So she would just stay put and not go anywhere and not, like, run around in the dangerous dark. And so they could see where she's sitting there, and she's sitting there, and then she gets, she's bored. So she starts kind of trying to climb down off the ledge, and with her toes and with her hands, she's grabbing on, and she, she slides down, and she gets scared, and then she starts climbing back up. And you see those fingerprints, you know, those toe prints to where this little girl was sitting there bored going up and down and up and down. And that's just a very kind of human touch, something that, you know, shows us that they were not that much different than we are today. Um, and uh, so that's those, that's pretty much, I think, everything I have. I mean, the, my last couple things are really the outro, the out, oh, no, I'm lying. Actually, I'm going to send you guys a couple more files. This is just for you to look at them. I only have very few things to say about, but it's something that, you know, Zhitinyov always ends his uh, lectures with, and I think it's a good idea. So they found in, in one of the locations, so they found basically an artist's sketch album is what they did, what they found. So there was an artist sitting there, and he was using these flat pieces of stone to just doodle on, and he was unlike... A lot of them, he was a very talented artist. These are very small. They're like, could be basically the size of a sheet of paper. And, uh, you know, and, and of course, with being stone, he used it over and over and over the same uh, thing. So it took quite, it, they still deciphering what was all sketched on there because he would sketch one thing, kind of squiggle it over, sketch another thing. But he was basically drawing little portraits of his neighbors. And so this is what these people look like. And I think it's pretty cool. And it gives you kind of that, again, I mean, this is something you could probably see in, you know, your newspaper when we still had them. I mean, drawings like this, these little kind of humorous sketches of your neighbors, of your, you know. Uh, La, La Marche, that's the name of the cave. I knew I had the name of it somewhere. Yes, yeah, the La, La Marche um, location. But yeah, these are just the little drawings of these people that they found. It's basically, it, it's, it's an artist kind of, you know, just throwaway sketch album. And something I wanted to show you guys. Because it's it's pretty. It, I think it's they're charming. They're very real. They're not these grand, you know, uh, religious things that you find on the cave walls. This is just a guy just doodling. So, so uh, you know what what we really see from this whole thing, you know, before, that from you know from Spain to Siberia, Europe really was one united. It was a single you, um, space. I mean, the people were genetically. Inter more or less related. I mean, it was, it was a single flowing community that migrated both ways, that carried the same culture with thousands of years without any change whatsoever. And these people, and now I'm again kind of quoting my wine. You know, when we think about Ice Age hunters, we always think about all four people. They lived in this horrible time of I Ice Age. No, they lived in a plentiful time of Ice Age. Um, they were very well adapted to it because it was cold, but it was dry. You had tons of meat running around. If you wanted to go eat, you know, you did what we did do today. Hmm, what do I want for dinner today? Okay, that horse. I mean, there was just a plentitude of meat running around, eating, grazing every which direction. I mean, all you had to do is walk out and go poof, you know, throw your spear one way or the other. I mean, these people were very well adapted to the Ice Age. The Ice Age to them was normal. And when they, what archaeology shows us is when the ice sheets, when the ice sheets started retreating and they started going away, the people, rather than rejoicing, they followed the ice sheets because it was a familiar environment for them. So for the people of that time period, the end of the Ice Age was an absolute, you know, apocalyptic catastrophe. It was the end of the world as they knew it. All the animals that they have known, that they have tracked for thousands and thousands of years, 30,000 years, 40,000 years, all the, the entire 
their entire way of life, their entire set of religious and, you know, mythological beliefs, whatever, their legends, everything started literally melting underneath their feet. And this melting was happening pretty fast. I mean, only a couple hundred years and it was gone. I mean, that's, that's almost instantaneous. Water started rising and covering certain areas, which is, you know, there is a good re reason to believe that the, there is the, the, the flood stories that kind of so prevalently cir circulate in human uh, history. That's where they come from. They don't come from any single given event, but it is a single event. It's the event when the, you know, the ice sheet started melting and the water everywhere rose up and started flooding the various familiar lands. It was a disaster. It was a catastrophe. It was the world coming apart. And, um, you know, not, and when those ice sheets, they melt in there, you don't only have just the flooding, but it creates a cyclone overhead. So in some areas, you've got severe uh, snowstorms. And there's actually some nations, they have the flood, you know, kind of the flood story to where other nations, for example, the Aryans, early Aryans, their kind of uh, apocalyptic story is the great snow when they were snowed in for years at a time. And we will talk about that here pretty soon when we start talking about the, the birth of the nomadic civilization. But this world has lived in basically some sort of form of a shamanistic tradition where they felt very secure in their shamans. They felt very secure in their spirits. You had very clear understanding of the world. You have people li living here. You have spirits living on the other side. You have these wise people or talented people who, have, who are basically the vehicles for communication with the other world. And they can always make a deal. They're good negotiators. You know, you, 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 know, you don't have rain. You go to your shaman, you get rain. Somebody gets sick, you go to your shaman, stuff happens. Well, suddenly that whole worldview that stable and very um, reliable wave. It's just simple way of doing things. You know, we do this, this happens. It's always worked. It worked for thousands of years, as long as anybody remembered. And suddenly it stopped working. And I, you know, this is a, a kind of a theory that again, Marwine proposed, I stand behind it, that this is where the uniform shamanism of the entire humanities in places started not only breaking apart in the sense that people no longer believed that shamanism worked, it started being outlawed. And that's where you get the whole idea that magic is evil. Anybody performing magicians, wizards, witches, whatever you want to call them, start being outlawed throughout humanity in different places. And that's where you suddenly get the rise of gods for the first time. Because, and we will actually, my whole next episode is going to be on, sh on shamanism and the difference between magic and religion. But this is the birth of religion as such, because these deities that, well, these entities that we've been negotiating with, they failed us. So now we need to find higher, tougher creatures that we cannot negotiate with, that we are entirely at their mercy because the world, as we know, just fell apart. So that's kind of, that's my kind of exit little speech because that's what I want to talk about next time is really shamanism and that's the way it's different from religion. And then we're going to go into, you know, early nomadic cultures and cities. Uh, some of those big game cultures would have bands, bands, not tribes, but bands of up to 100 people. In the Mesolithic, that fell off to about 30. So you were, they were very successful cultures. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, that's actually the optimal human society size. You know, that's why we have, you know, military units. I mean, I'm sure a lot of you know this, you know, why we have kindergarten and, you know, classes. So when you have a college class with 300, 500 kids, that's just stupid. I mean, 40 individuals per group is as much as a human being is physically capable of tolerating and interacting with at any given time. Um, but no, I mean, they were very successful. I agree with you. And, uh, you know, and I think that it's very important to understand that the end of the Ice Age really was an absolute disaster for humans as a species. So anybody else? Yeah, I have a question. It's, um, uh, actually, this like is a, a different when you're saying, but the same time period, like 20,000 years ago or so, there's an idea that Soltrians, people from what is now Spain and France, ended up following the ice across the Atlantic into North America. Um, they were th they got there actually before what's now natives did. That's that's a theory. It's wondering what you, know, you think about. That. And you know what? That's something that I, I, I'm kind of leaving that aside because I want to do the whole settlement of America, which is a very iffy, tricky question with a lot of aspects in it. There's the mythology, there's the linguistics, which comparative linguistics is just not spoken about. I don't know why in Western, uh, um, I think it's probably because it just takes so flipping long to do. I mean, it takes literally a lifetime to study just one little thing. And I think it's easier to just compare toponyms, you know, by plugging them into a computer yeah. statistical program. Ryan, did you want to say something? Oh, I was just going to comment on what uh, uh, you and uh, David uh, were talking about, about the group size. Um, 
I've heard it recently. It, this is not like um, a hard science or anything, but the last estimate that I heard about the maximum number of uh, interpersonal relationships that a homo sapien is really capable of is right around 300 ish. Yeah. I mean, can you even remember 300 people's names? That alone is hard. And obviously we have not really evolved to where we can just uh, have interpersonal relationships uh, personally, intimately with, you know, thousands and thousands of people. That's been very hard for us. So that I think is something that is very important to touch on at least. Yeah, absolutely. And no, and you know what, you're absolutely right. There are studies to that, but there's a difference between, uh, you know, the 300 roughly is maximum amount of uh, just individual, like connections a person can remember that they have, you know, that's different from the people you interact with day to day. I mean, day to day, 30 to 40 individuals is really absolute physical maximum for any human being under any circumstances. And that's, you know, and that shows up over and over in every tribal group. That's what you get. I mean, even when you have larger tribes, I mean, they come together, they could fall apart. They come together, they fall apart. And this kind of very crowded civilization that we have right now, it is very new. It is very, mm, you don't get me started on what I think about modern society. I mean, um, I think that it's it's pushing the limits of physiology. It's pushing the limits of psychology. I mean, we have a lot of pathology going on right now for reasons that uh, people are living in conditions that their bodies just have not evolved to actually cope with yet. And evolution, you know, you can only speed it up so much. I mean, yes, it is speeding up because people are speeding it up artificially, but it's also slowing down because people are, have invented a lot of wonderful things like medicine which, you know, is extremely important when our loved ones are in trouble. But in the long run, you know, how it affects the population, nobody knows the outcome of that particular gamble. And uh, it's, it's a question without an answer. It's a question that I don't have an answer for. There's no right approach to that. But uh, humans are definitely doing things to their psychology, to their social structures, to their neurophysiology, to everything that, I'm, I mean, I don't know what kind of an animal we're going to have at the end of, you know, next 200, 300 years, um, even just as far as the psychology goes, not to mention physical evolution, which right now the brains are actually shrinking and they're shrinking fairly quickly comparing to how quickly they were growing. Um, the guts are shrinking. Um, you know, the, the, I mean, the, Drobyshevsky, who is my, I mean, everybody loves Drobyshevsky. I really wish he did lectures in English. You guys would be rolling on the floor laughing. He's so funny. But, you know, he did a lecture about the man of the future and he portrays this, you know, this thing was just a brain and big long <clears throat> multi-component fingers and like no anything else pretty much but um i mean you know time will show 500 years from now i'll be very curious to look back at what scientists and anthropologists say about today it's going to be an interesting read yeah well i guess we can't know yet but it seems like um for a long time not just recently but especially over the last like 500 years but even before that uh, we're very good at making new fancy technology, new new fancy tools, but we don't seem to be that much better at understanding how to utilize them. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> yep. Yep. You know, you can only wait and see, right? Well, I guess that's everything. Thank you, everyone who joined me on next Thursday. We're doing shamanism. And if you can join me, that will be great. Let me know and I'll send you a link. All right. Thanks for inviting me. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. And I'm praying it recorded. Just pray with me. Whatever you yeah, did, you believe in. It still says, <laughs> it says it's recording. Thanks, Julie. Okay, okay thank you. Bye. 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 that exist within every man's soul. Every man's and we will soul. live forever or as long as stories are told. Stories are told. Stories we are the archetypes that exist within every man's soul.